for those people that have been on YouTube and are looking at their most recent uploads, YouTube now is giving you a score out of 10 for that video. I want you to ignore that, or again, take the mindset that it's interesting. That really adds no value to you uh, because how a video performs in the first week, first two weeks is no indication of how it can perform long-term. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Justin Brown. If you don't know who Justin is, you got to know Justin. He is a video strategist who helps businesses grow and scale an audience with YouTube. His program is called Primal Video Accelerator, and his YouTube channel has more than 1.5 million, yes, 1.5 million subscribers. Justin, welcome back to the show. I think your channel has grown quite a bit since you were last on the show. Thank you very much for having me back on. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's crazy, but I mean, this is this is this is the fun world that we live in now. So yeah. absolutely. And today, Justin and I are going to explore how to improve your YouTube video strategy with analytics. Now, I know that some of the people listening today may not be super technical or analytical, but that's okay. We're going to break it down in a way that's going to be super valuable for everyone. Um, I guess one of the first questions I want to ask you before we get into that is, why should creators, marketers consider longer form content on YouTube. Today, it seems that the whole world is focused on YouTube shorts, TikTok, reels, dot, 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 and everything is like sub 60 seconds. Um, what do you want to say to those that are listening on the longer form media and why it might be worth consideration? I think there's nothing wrong with the short form content, right? Uh, there's obviously a need for it. There's a want for it. There's people are consuming it. And YouTube has copied and followed along with that, uh, that trend as well. But most people are still coming to YouTube for regular videos. And we look at YouTube as a whole, it's actually trying to cover a lot of bases. It's got shorts, it's got stories, it's got a community tab. Uh, so that's like the, the Facebook newsfeed, how it used to be back in the day. It's got live streams, it's now got podcasts as well. So YouTube's goal is to be the one place for all types of content. But the thing that we're getting the most success with and our clients and students as well is the regular videos where you can have a deeper conversation than one minute or three minutes if you need to. You can deep dive into a topic really build that know, like, and trust with your audience. And the, the repercussions from that is tenfold for growing your business and brand. Well, and also really worth consideration for those that are familiar with how TikTok and Reels works. You know, TikTok and Reels will go out and find you an audience, right? And they will keep delivering your content in front of a new audience. But YouTube does that with the longer form content, which I think is so important, right? Because Normally, people that are in the marketing world are creating short content with the intent of trying to get them to more of their content, longer media, right? So that they can turn into a customer or they can turn into a subscriber or something that is more meaningful than just a 30 second, 15 second, 60 second view. So with YouTube, and Justin knows this and I know this, um, but Justin really knows this, that um, you create great content, YouTube will deliver that content to the right audience for free, period, full stop, right? And guess what? Instagram, they're going to want you to pay them some money, right? YouTube will actually pay you money and provide an audience to you. I find that super exceptionally valuable. What do you have to say about that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that we didn't go into this YouTube channel thinking we're going to make some, some YouTube dollars. But look, I tell you now, it's not a small amount that's dropping into our bank account each month. So it, it helps have uh, it helps grow the business. It helps us create more content, helps us have more impact out there. But I think the place that a lot of people go wrong with this is that they're looking for that quick win. They're looking for fast eyeballs. And that's not regular YouTube videos for most of us. So if you need fast eyeballs on something, the trending stuff like shorts, like reels, yeah, you can get fast eyeballs on that stuff. Uh, ads, obviously, is a great way to get fast eyeballs. But outside that long-term organic traffic, there's nothing else that competes with YouTube regular videos. Like we have content that is over eight years old that is still getting hundreds to thousands of views per day on these videos that are eight years old. No extra input, no extra effort, no extra work. Those videos are still showing up on the platform. They're showing up and helping people, adding value. Um, they're solving people's pains and problems. They're still got uh, links clicked in them. So we're making uh, generating revenue from affiliate links, but also they're still having ads played on them as well. Eight years on, there's no other platform that has that ability, which is crazy. 
Well, and the other side of it is you can edit the description. You can edit the thumbnail. You can do call to action changes on the videos. I mean, you can't do this on the other things. Once you create on the other platforms, if you upload a video to Instagram, I don't think you can do anything with it. I think you're stuck with it, you know, but that's not the case with YouTube. And I find that exceptionally valuable. And then, you know, I'm curious, how often are you publishing videos on your channel? This is the other side of it that I think can be magical for people because you don't need to publish a lot to have a huge return, right? Yeah, so I'm one of those weird people that actually likes making videos and likes editing videos. And, and for us, like I'm not a YouTuber. We use it for business growth. If it wasn't working for business growth, then we wouldn't be doing it. So if you're if you're a marketer, if you're if working for a business, then this is a massive opportunity too. But for us, we upload one video per week. Now, one, it's one strategic video. It's one optimized video. We're researching. We're we're making sure that this is actually something that people want. It's not just a random idea. But that one video is enough for you to, to build this amazing organic traffic engine. And if you're sitting here listening to this thinking, um, look, I can't do one video a week. And I totally get it. In some industries, some types of videos, especially if you're making something, it's going to be hard for you to create one piece of content like that a week. So one every other week or whatever you can commit to, uh, it, it doesn't need to be amount of content. You don't need to be posting daily. We're also not everywhere. I don't have a massive Instagram, TikTok, and all these other things. We went all in on one. And it's much easier when you can just focus on one platform, uh, give it what it needs, help your viewers, have an amazing experience for them, than trying to spread yourself too thin and end up being nowhere, really, because you, you spread yourself everywhere. So um, we're going to get into analytics here, but I want to just throw, ask you to throw out a couple of metrics, if you know it off the top of your head. Um, you're publishing one video a week, and about how many people per month are watching the videos on your channel? Uh, we already mentioned you have somewhere around 1.5 million subscribers, but what does that actually equate to in monthly views on your YouTube channel? So our average is 1.8 million views per month to 2.2. So depending on, that's 28 days is the general metric that YouTube gives you. So it fluctuates and this is, it could be uh, the higher searched uh, terms are, are popping up. So like when the, the world went into lockdown, right, our views skyrocketed massively because there was more people on the platform looking for those things. So we have a very uh, strategic approach, a very search-based approach where I don't want to try and hope to go viral. Uh, that's a that's a bad business decision or a stressful business decision. Let's put it that way. Uh, if you've got to try and go viral. It's hard to repeat. Week. Yeah, it's hard to, right. hard to repeat, right? Yeah, you, you might have a couple that take off. But for us, we have a very focused strategic approach where we are doing things like diving into the analytics. We're seeing what's working. We're looking at what people actually want. And then we'll tweak and adjust and, 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 and grow from there. So it's very strategic. For a lot of people uh, to have an audience that big for them would be massive, you know, and uh, what's really great is that you're only publishing one video a week and that seems really like a great ROI and obviously you've been doing this for many, many years. How long have you been hardcore at this? Um, I feel like I met you maybe five or six years ago. Is that about when you kind of dug deep into this thing? Yeah, so we started the channel eight years ago, and it was a side thing. It was really uh, neglected, let's put it this way. We would just create random videos uh, and throw them on the platform and hope that they got views, and they didn't. No one wanted that stuff, or no one could find it because we weren't providing the right information to YouTube and to the viewers, so we wasted a lot of time. And look, I mean, this is where we see so many people that are stuck there with the same issues and problems that we had, uh, and that's why we now want to help people with this stuff because it's not that hard if you are strategic with it. But just the build it and they will come or create a video, throw it up there, it's very hard. I, I'm not saying it's impossible. It was very hard to have uh, traction that way and repeat traction that way. Uh, so yeah, one video cool. a week. All right, let's talk about um, how we should be thinking about analytics and particularly what we need to be looking at. Um, we're going to kind of move semi-systematically through some of the things that we've agreed to talk about here. But um, first of all, where do we find the analytics for those of us that don't even know where to look and, you know, um, kind of what should we be looking for in the beginning? 
So there's two places that you can access the YouTube analytics. You can access it on an individual video. So if you're signed into your YouTube account, you're, you wanna find out or dive deep into one specific video, then if you're logged in, you're on that video, then there's an edit, uh, view analytics button underneath it. Um, but where you would normally access your analytics for your channel wide, and you can still dive into the individual videos from there as well, is up in the top right-hand corner, there's your little profile picture. If you click on that, then open up the studio dashboard. That's kind of your, your back end of your YouTube channel. In there on the left, there is a button that says analytics. And uh, that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's where you can access all the good stuff. And this is where whatever questions you have, whatever doubts you have about your content performing, all of your answers are in your analytics. They're super powerful, but a lot of people get freaked out when they're in there with numbers and graphs and things and uh, yeah. So I wanna help you look at this, uh, and make sense of it. All right, so we're in YouTube Studio, we're looking at our analytics. What should we be looking at? Because it does kind of get a little overwhelming. Okay, so the first thing I wanna set this up is I want you to look at this without judgment. I want you to take the mindset here of that it's, it's interesting. So if you see that one video has a much higher click-through rate than something else, or you're looking at your click-through rate uh, or some of your watch time analytics and you're comparing it to another channel, we can't compare. There is no ever apples to apples comparison here. Even if it's the same topics of videos, um, they're different, right? It's a different person behind them. So you're, you're a different content, different perspective, different thoughts and opinions. So the content you comparing is not going to do anything. Your goal here is to look at what your numbers are and you compete against yourself. You improve against yourself. So if your click-through rate is 5%, we want to increase that. So that's the first thing I wanted you to look at. It's just interesting. It's not good or bad. The other thing I wanna point out first is that for those people that have been on YouTube and are looking at their most recent uploads, YouTube now is giving you a score out of 10 for that video. I want you to ignore that, or again, take the mindset that it's interesting. That really adds no value to you uh, because how a video performs in the first week, first two weeks is no indication of how it can perform long-term. So given the strategy that we take, where it's a very search, very optimized strategic approach, it often tells us that the videos that we're releasing are number 10 out of 10. So I could be down in the dumps, beat myself up and think I've just created a crappy video or something that no one wants. Well, and we should explain 10 out of 10 is comparing it to like- Sorry. The video. Yeah, explain, Lower, com explain yeah. what that's, comparing it to the last, your best performing videos. Isn't that what it's doing? Yeah, so it looks at how your videos are performing the last 10 videos, how they've performed. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and if you've got a 10, that's not good, right? This is performing the lowest. It's the worst performing in that time period compared to your previous 10. So a lot of people get really, uh, I guess, upset at this point. And they're thinking, I'm, I'm not doing good here but some of our lowest ones initially have gone on to be the biggest ones on the channel. So I think, look, I, the analytics is good, but it can be a negative thing if you're taking it to heart. We've got to look at, these are just numbers, and these are just numbers for right now. And one of the biggest things that we already mentioned, the power of YouTube is that your content can stick around for years. It doesn't say how it compares to videos from five years ago on that page. It's just saying your most recent 10. And what we find is that our videos can take up to three months to really filter into the algorithm for YouTube to really understand the best viewers for them. So then it pushes it out from there. So just wanted to clarify that up front because we hear this a lot. My videos are tanking, but compared to what? They haven't been on there long enough is normally the answer. Okay, what what else should we be looking for? What about like where people are coming from? Do we need to be looking yeah. at it at all? So, so let's just say that you've been on YouTube for a little while and you wanna work out why it's not growing or you wanna look at uh, just, just how your channel is performing overall. The first place I look at is where is your traffic actually coming from? Is it random? As in, uh, is it just showing up as a, as a recommendation for someone uh, as a, as a, on the browse features, is it showing up on the homepage somewhere over people? How, how are people finding it? How will they access it? So your traffic sources is the area on YouTube where it shows you where all of your traffic is coming from. So for us, the biggest by far is YouTube search. The second is external, but it's Google search because we've optimized not mm -hmm. just for have a viral channel. We've optimized for 
to show up when people are looking for stuff. So they don't necessarily need to come and find my channel and think, I need to see Justin's thoughts and opinions on this. Some do, but what if they don't know you yet? What if they've never heard of me, heard of your channel before? Then we want to show up when they are looking for us or looking for related content, looking at things like how to, how to edit videos, what editing software to use. We totally dominate those search phrases so that we, we have a traffic source, we have a pipeline. Think of it like a funnel in marketing, right? That's the top of the funnel is when people are looking for an answer uh, they're, they're, or, or entertainment on YouTube too, they're typing stuff in, we wanna show up there. That's your low hanging fruit. So if your traffic sources are anything other than that, it is beyond your control a lot more than if it was uh, YouTube search traffic. So I'm not saying that's wrong or bad, but I would be looking at, especially if it's an underperforming video, an underperforming channel, how do we change some of these things on YouTube? How, there's some of the inputs, the titles, tags, descriptions, and things. How do we change some of these things uh, to help YouTube understand our content, but also help our viewers see that our content is a fit? So the first thing I look at is the traffic source. Where's it coming from? Or is it, you know, even if it's low numbers, it's still interesting, right? The second thing we look at then is your click-through rate. And your click-through rate is a combination of the impressions that you get. So where YouTube has put your video somewhere on the platform, could be anywhere, anywhere that's shown is an impression, right? And then the amount of times it gets clicked from that impression. Now, this is another one where it's not, you know, it's a great one to track, your click-through rate, how many clicks you're getting, um, but it's never a definitive uh, I guess North Star is to change direction totally because some videos will have much higher impressions than others because YouTube might put that video on the homepage. It might put it in top of search results. And oh, this is an important distinction, everybody, because like this is a this is one of those um, metrics that can mess you up because mm. let's say you had a six percent click-through rate and then all of a sudden it went down to one percent click-through rate yeah. but all of a sudden but the impressions went through the roof because for whatever reason um the algorithm started showing you in the recommended videos thing right so would you rather have one percent of a million or ten percent of ten thousand you know they're the, they're actually about the same if i'm not mistaken right if i'm doing my math right right so you got to ask yourself like you know, like, or, or, or let me say it another way. Would you rather have 2% of a million or would you rather have 5% of a hundred thousand? I'd take 2% of a million every day of the week because it's way higher than you think. So that's where, that's where you got to mentally say, okay, if the click through rate is dropping, maybe it's because YouTube is showing this video to a ton of people because it really likes the video. And that's where the views are more important than the click through rate. Am I right on that? Oh, 100%. And this is where if you're just watching that percentage, that click through rate and say, yeah, it's 7%. This is this is not bad uh, compared to what you're normally getting. I'm not saying 7% is what you should be aiming for. Some people are much higher, some people are much lower. Uh, so, but yeah, if you see it drop, then don't think that it's a bad thing. Um, this is where you've got to look at everything again as it's interesting, but also that we want to look at the next metric as well, which is your watch time. So uh, it's all well and good to show up on the platform for people to click on your video. If they don't stick around and watch your video, YouTube's gonna think that it's not really a fit for them. So YouTube is just constantly testing your content in front of new people and in different places to try and find the ideal audience. It's not squashing small creators. It's not singling channels out and saying, you're not getting views. All the views are going to these other people. That's, that's, that's not how it works. It's trying to get good content in front of the people that when they want it. So your watch time or how long people are actually sticking around and watching your content is really important. So you wanna make sure then that you are doing the best you can to let people know that they are in the right place when they land on your video and do the best you can to keep them engaged watching your video for as long as possible. I know that we spoke about a lot of this on a previous podcast that we did as well. Yeah, so um, the three metrics that we just talked about is traffic, source, right? Which is where is it coming from? Click through rate and watch time. And I think you and I would agree that the most important metric here is probably watch time, right? Because my understanding and your understanding is that if you can get someone to actually watch more of the video, then that's going to, that means all the other metrics are going to hopefully go up. Is that fair assessment? Meaning there's going to be more views. There's going to be more potential sources of where that video is getting sourced to. Is that fair? Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, and look, if we're going to Take a step back again, like what does YouTube want? It wants time on platform. And time on platform 
you know, where people go down the YouTube rabbit hole and they start watching one video, next minute they're watching a cat video, the 40 minutes goes by, that's what YouTube wants. So by you giving a good experience to your viewers, giving them everything that they want or need in your content, you're going to have them stick around longer on that video, which means that they're sticking around longer on the platform. And this is like, if you take this approach when you're strategizing your content, like what do people need? Um, what would they click on? Because again, world's best video, if no one clicks on it, no one's gonna see it. So your click-through rates is important there, but it's the video itself that is the piece that's going to keep them on the platform uh, and engaged in watching your content. When you track these analytics, and we're gonna get into some really sexy stuff here coming up soon, folks, trust me. But when you test, when you track these analytics, do you mostly just go into the YouTube studio and look at it, or are you exporting stuff into a spreadsheet? I'm just curious like how you decide to track all this stuff. So we normally now just use the YouTube uh, analytics. So there is an advanced mode on there as well. So for those of you that do like your uh, your Excel spreadsheets and those kinds of things, deep dive into it, there is an area for you as well. But for most of the time, I'm just jumping into that main dashboard area and I'm changing the dates. Up in the top right-hand corner, you can change uh, the date range. So if I'm comparing something or testing something, I can go back and set a specific week or month, uh, make a change. And again, YouTube, it's not a quick thing, right? So if if you make a change, you're testing stuff, you wanna give it some time. I would say at least a month, but if you're not getting much traffic or much impressions early on, then maybe those tests run a little longer. Uh, because again, it can take up to around three months sometimes for some of our content to show up uh, or, or uh, find its place, I guess, inside the algorithm. So um, yeah. Real quick on, on seasonality. Um, I would imagine certain kinds of videos have seasons where, for example, let's just talk about like, spring you know what i mean like uh whatever country you're in right then if you're doing like gardening videos they're going to be more popular in the spring than they will potentially be in the fall or if you're doing certain holiday videos or whatever so this is where you might want to compare the time of year against the prior time of year right i mean in, a year ago to kind of see if it's working if there's any seasonality have you found that because not everybody like you creates stuff that's evergreen yeah, and look, there's nothing wrong with creating trending topics, content as well, uh, right. or or definitely seasonality uh, with right. your content. But yeah, you, you've got to then take it into context of this video can't probably perform uh, uh, outside of its time. Um, right. So if it is a trending topic, like we, we have a, a, a lot of clients and students that they, they create content around like news or new release products and things. Right. Um, but after that product's not new anymore, it's it's gonna make sense that the viewer's not that interested or not as interested in it anymore, especially if a new model comes out. So we gotta look at your content and say, what's our goal here? And I'm not saying don't make those videos, but if you want stuff that's gonna show up for years, then we've gotta create that content somewhere too. Well, and even in that situation, if you're, let's say, doing video camera reviews, which I know sometimes you do, well, you could go back and look at the last time you did a video camera review and look at the first 90 days and see what your benchmark is, right? And then you can kind of know whether you're above it or below it. Is that kind of what you do? Yeah, for sure. And this is where like a massive opportunity as well is that so many people think that their content is one and done. I can't make this video again. It's already up on the YouTube channel. But you've got to, again, think of the viewer. And what's the viewer going to click on? Are they going to click on a video from right now or are they going to click on a video from two years ago? And if they think that the topic might, that something might've changed. So for me in a tech space, even if nothing has changed on that specific topic, I can still remake that video. But the kicker here is I can go back in time. I can look at the analytics from that previous video. I can look at the watch time, see where it dropped off at all. If there's anything I could do, if anything I can improve, I could also, um, look at the thumbnail image and see what worked. If there was any tests that we were running with that, I could see what did we do last time? What could we take? What could we learn? So the next version of that video, when it hits YouTube, is so much further along than the first time we created it. And I'll leave the existing video up there is the other big question we get. What do you do with the old ones? We leave it up there. Yeah, so, um, okay, so you have kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit more and we'll get back to this other question in a bit. But um, I love the idea that what you're really telling me is, hey, we can learn from our older videos. And by the way, marketers, we should always learn from everything we've ever done. And this is the mistake so many marketers do is they forget, they forget that you've done a lot of work You've got this past history of work you've done. Sometimes it's email campaigns. Sometimes it's whatever, right? But you kind of rinse and repeat sometimes. And the idea that you can go back, 
which YouTube is great at because all that data is there, right? It's not like Google Analytics, which is about to go bye-bye, right? And it's all that data is going to be gone when they go to GA4. This is always going to be there for you. So you can go back and you can kind of put on your sleuthing glasses, if you will, and your Sherlock Holmes hat, and you can actually really do some really fancy analysis on these older videos so that next one, whether it be same exact topic or similar subject, can be incrementally better. So let's dive in a little bit more on on what you were talking about, about what we should be looking for on those older videos. Yeah, so again, I'm gonna look at those exact same things that we looked at when we're analyzing our analytics. So we wanna go and look at the traffic sources again, right? Where did this traffic come from? Or where, where is it not coming from where we wanna optimize for? And the, the benefit of YouTube that you touched on earlier is that with this stuff, we can we can go back, we, we can re-optimize all the content um, and really give our video a, a refresh in the algorithm here. But we can also use it to dictate our new content going forward. So there's really two plays here. Um, so to looking at our, our content, um, I, I want to look at the traffic source and see where we're hitting, what search terms, because YouTube will tell you what are people typing in to find your content. It'll tell you what other... Uh, videos are recommending your content? What other channels are your viewers watching? So it's a good idea to go and check out those channels to see what type of content they have. You might get some ideas, some inspiration for more content that you could create. I'm not saying you're going to be ripping off their content because again, we're sharing your thoughts and opinions on these specific topics, but why reinvent the wheel? You know, if you know something's working, you know, you see a video that has millions of views, then it could be an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and opinions on it. Watch time is the biggest one, though, that I would be looking at if I'm analyzing older content um, is to see exactly what the viewer journey is, what's happening on that video. Um, and an interesting tip here that came from our YouTube partner manager was if you are looking at some of your older videos and you see a drop point, uh, obviously, if you're making that video, uh, you, you again, then don't don't do whatever you did at that point. But that doesn't mean that that video is dead at that point. You could add in a card, so the clickable link that pops up just before that time. Or if you see the average watch time is four minutes 30, then just before the four minutes 30, because again, it's an average, then put a card off to another video that you knew that video, that viewer in that uh, space and time that's watching that specific video that they might else be interested in, that you're going to click them off to another video to, I mean, that video is, is clearly, they're going to drop off soon anyway, if we go by averages, right? We know that we know that for a fact. So what could we do to encourage them to jump to another video that we know that they are likely going to be interested in? So you can add in a clickable card retrospectively as well. I love that. Um, I really, really like that idea. So getting back to looking at our older videos, we're looking at the retention graph. And for those that don't know what we're talking about, imagine something that starts on X, Y axis and it's 100% at the top and it just moves over time and it drops, right? And sometimes we see dramatic drops. Sometimes we see gradual drops. Sometimes we see spikes. And a lot of times those spikes are because maybe uh, Google search, right, is showing just a segment of the video that it thinks is the most important. What do we do with that? Does that mean that could be like really good fodder for us to like make a shorter video that and look for these high spikes? I mean, like, what do you do when you're looking at that retention graph? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that could be that spike could be its own YouTube short. It could be its own reel or TikTok or something. And you, you, there's different strategies with that. We could literally just resample a piece from that clip, or you could go and actually shoot that same piece of content again. Just grab your phone, and I would suggest to do both. Uh, why not? We think that uh, a lot of people don't make videos because like, it's already up there on the channel. I've already said that. I've already, I, there's so many things that I say in the videos that I'm said in other videos. And it was strange for me at first because I was of that mindset of it's already up there. But what if people haven't heard it yet? We assume that people have seen all the stuff that we uh, that we create, but look, an interesting stat, an interesting number is 96% of our views come from people who aren't subscribed to our channel. Now, there's a couple of things that we could look at there with value of subscriber or not, but again, we wanna show up, we wanna help people when they're looking for something. You mentioned Google search as well. Yeah, we have a lot of our videos that come through there and it's not necessarily the whole video that's recommended. It could be those little snippets. So that is a great indicator that this is something that people actually want. But you can also find those things ahead of time too by doing your keyword 
and topic research um, and seeing what are the things that people are actually looking for. And then you can make it easy for people to find those sections in your videos and for Google to understand that content um, by adding in your chapter markers inside of your YouTube videos as well. So if you've got videos on your channel right now, then uh, you could easily go back and add in things like the chapter markers to help Google understand your content and YouTube because they're, they're both search engines. And you can also then, um, yeah, help people find and navigate around those videos. This is something that increased our watch time. You would think by giving people permission to jump around in your videos would be something that you don't want. No, I want them to watch the whole thing start to finish. But let's take a look at the mindset of someone that is jumping around in your video. Maybe they weren't committed in the first place. Maybe they just wanted to skim through and see, is this video actually for me? Or um, should I have clicked the shorter video? We've all got options on YouTube, right? So you're, you, if you can make it easier for people to see what it is you actually cover in your videos, then um, and, and those spikes are a great indication of the things that people like, then help people find them. So you can add those chapter markers or those timestamps in so they can jump straight to those sections. A couple other questions on our older videos. Um, does it ever make sense to edit clips out of those videos, which sounds like, oh, why would I ever do that? You know what I mean? And then also, what about looking at the comment section as a possible resource for new ideas? Two great ideas, great strategies. And this is something that we've been playing with as well. Uh, so look, just for full context, you can't in a sense, you can't re-edit a YouTube video, right? Um, if you want to change the music or something like that, it's generally, it's a new video. You can't replace a video. But there is a YouTube video editor on the platform where it is uh, subtractive. So you can take pieces away from your video. And this is something that we've been playing with recently. And it's uh, so far, it's working incredibly well. So what we've done is we've gone back and looked at some of our older videos. And if I just talked too much at the start, my hook was wasn't as good as what I thought it was at the time of filming. And the, the analytics, the data is showing us that people just dropped off at that point. I lost their interest. We can go back, if it makes sense for the video, and I could take that sentence out or a couple of sentences out. And it's instant. It's, it's just right? going to look like a jump. It's not going to look pretty, but it will do the job, right? Yeah. And this is where it doesn't matter. As an editor and someone who used to edit professionally on Netflix and things like this is not something that I would have ever thought that I would be doing. And I thought people are going to notice. No, people like they, they respect that. They respect that you respect their time. Um, so just get to the point. You know, if you're seeing those comments, just get to the point or video starts at and they're putting the time in to save other people's time. That's a great indication that maybe you talked a little bit too much at the start. Uh, so I would experiment. Now, this is something you can undo as well. What have so you found? A, what have you, wait, you cannot do what? Say it again. You can, you can undo. So oh, if you, uh, you can test this, right? So if you take a chunk of your video out, uh, say you, you see a clear drop or, or you just want to experiment with an older video on your channel that's uh, not performing well, the watch time isn't great, like experiment taking something out at the start to tighten that hook up, get to the content bit quicker. It could be that you just start the video with the content. This is one of the tests that we did. I removed the, the start altogether. It's an older video, uh, it was worth the test. And look, we've seen a huge increase on every video that we've tested this with. I can't guarantee that this is for you, but in our tests, where we've taken out those strategic sentences um, that we can clearly see it's extra padding or extra waffle or fluff in the video, uh, that we have seen a significant increase on watch time on those specific videos. Um, so. It okay, is question. Is there, is there a, um, do you recommend just going one sentence at a time instead of just chopping, chopping big sections out? You know? Yeah, I think on, on one video, it definitely made sense for us to take, take a paragraph out, uh, okay. looking at it in hindsight. But look, it's a hard one because you still got to give it the time. Like you make this change. It's not like your your data, your analytics is going to update instantly and show you that there's an increase, decrease. You've got to look at this in context over time. And it could even be a different viewer behavior, like a different type of viewer watching your video might resonate more with it. And then YouTube's got to go find more of those specific viewers that like similar content. So it, what I'm saying is like, it could take time. So these I love tests, you know, you know, yeah. people that have these stupid little animations that are like 30 seconds long after the yeah. intro, you could cut those out completely. Would you recommend that? For sure. And this is what we used to do it too. And like, yeah. where did they come from? They came from TV. We see these fantasy yeah. animations and things. Yeah. So we don't have any of that now. And our, 
what we have in our videos at the start, because we know that a lot of people are starting your content in um, uh, in silent, they're, they're toilet TV, right? They're sitting there scrolling. So <laughs> um, what we have is text on the start of the video. We get to the hook straight away. Um, and yeah, if we find that there's any extra sentences or anything, we come back later and we take them out and just test. We can always revert it back to how it was. What about comments for uh, Com inspiration? Yeah, comments is an absolute gold mine if you're getting comments through, right? So there's some videos that just don't encourage comments. We encourage comments and we call it out in the video, leave a comment, we'll ask a question towards the start of the video. So we encourage people to, to have a conversation down there. This is great for YouTube ranking because YouTube sees that it's not just an idle viewer, there's someone interacting with the platform, which is huge. Good or bad, the comment doesn't matter, it's still interaction with the platform. But you also get a ton of extra insights as to that content. Um, I like this video, it went for too long. You speak too fast. What about this option? Uh, so if you're listing out options for something and there's a new one, like this is where we're going for a bit of research as well because we do the best we can for researching topics, but we can go back to our older videos if we're gonna remake them and we can see what are the comments, what was the general vibe or feeling uh, in the comments for this video. And we can try to fix some of those things in the next video. Um, I would say, look, the other side of this is we have a lot of people then that will say, I made this video because I got a comment about this or my viewers are asking for this. And I'm not saying don't do that, but the strategy really shouldn't be dictated from your subscribers as far as I'm concerned. Like you should be having your own North Star. This is where I wanna take this business, this is where I wanna take this brand. If it's a fit, for sure. But I would still then take a step back and look at some data on that and say, all right, well, how many people actually want this thing? Am I making this for one or two people or am I making this to, to serve and to help a, a massive audience? Um, so yeah, comments can be really good. Love that. Okay. So a couple of things on optimizing our older videos to try to get more views. We talked, we spent quite a bit of time talking about cutting out the fluff. Um, what else can we do with these older videos that might actually help us get more views on them that we haven't addressed yet. Right, so the biggest things that YouTube is looking at in terms of ranking any type of content on the platform, its, it's goal is to understand your content. Its goal is to work out exactly what's happening in your video, and then it can go and try to find the best viewer for it, right? So that in a nutshell. And what so we look at what YouTube actually is looking at. It's looking at the title of your video, it's obviously tracking everything. It's tracking the data, as we said, with, with click-through rates and those kinds of things. So your title, your thumbnail, super important. Um, the description, the first, I think it's 155 characters, the first sentence or two is looking at as as information to your video as to what it's about and who it's for. Um, the tags, they're, they're there, but they're not really used too much anymore. Um, but hey, it's an opportunity for you to provide more information to YouTube as to what your video is about. So why not stack the deck in your favor? So we still use the tags, but the most important one is the video content itself. So if you find that you've got videos on your channel that aren't performing, they're not one and done. You can go back and you can re-optimize as we've touched on a couple of times here. So specifically what I would look at if I was re-optimizing an older video would be the title of the video. Uh, what what would people be searching for to find this? And if you're struggling with this, take a, take a step back on your content and think, what would you search for to find this? So there's a lot of people that title their videos that put their channel name in there. Well, it means nothing to people who don't know about your channel. Well, they'll put episode 320. How many people would watch an, a Netflix show starting at episode 320 or starting at episode two or three, right? You, you're probably not gonna do it because you feel like you've missed out. So you wanna take the approach of, again, what, what, would, what would I type in? What would someone who doesn't know me or my brand type in? And what do I want this to show up for? Where is this a fit? And that's where that keyword research is really powerful. So we wanna then, we can go back and we can change this stuff. So we wanna do some research on our topics, videos that aren't performing. And we wanna see like, what would I search for now? Has anything changed? Cause I obviously did the best I could when I first made this video, but it's clearly not working. And it's never really one thing. There's those three areas that we need to hit on, showing up on the platform, so YouTube understanding the content, getting the click and keeping people watching. You need to do those three things. If you're not doing those three things, it's gonna be very, very hard for you to grow. So we, with that approach, we can go back and we can change things at least easily for the first two. We can change 
how YouTube understands the content by looking at what the titles, tags, descriptions, the things that we just covered. We can adjust the thumbnail image, and this one has been massive for us. Uh, we even A-B split test, which we can talk a little bit about. Yeah, let's, let's talk about just real quick on changing titles, because for some people, they've been told never, ever change the titles uh, because it re-indexes the video. But what I'm hearing you say is, well, if it's not performing, yeah. what have you got to lose? Is that kind of really what I'm hearing 100%. you say? 100%. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Right. If it's not working, what what do you have to lose? Um, right. so th I, I'm all for not changing the title if it's performing. If it, if it ain't broke, don't don't fix it. Right. Let, let's leave it. If it's if it's working for you, don't touch anything. Uh, is working. So I'm talking about the ones that are underperforming, that aren't working for you. Um, and we've had great examples of people that have just changed their thumbnail images. That's all. Not changing anything else. And and it's essentially uh, or I mean. It, the videos have kicked off. Um, some of our first videos that we put out, uh, they're still there live on the channel now. When we released them, we got a few views on them and then nothing. They disappeared into the YouTube abyss. These were videos, how to film on iPhone, how to film on Android. Uh, I thought, okay, maybe people don't like me. Uh, maybe that content uh, no one actually wants. Uh, maybe I talked too much. So we, we start to ask these questions and, or think maybe YouTube is squashing small creators or some of those other myths. No, what if YouTube couldn't understand your content? What if the viewers weren't engaged in clicking on it or the title didn't grab their attention or the thumbnail image, they clicked on others instead of yours. So what if is again, that, the question that we wanna ask. It's interesting that it's not performing, but what if it could perform? So we went back to those videos around four Four months after we uploaded them, we changed the title, we changed the thumbnail image, and we changed some of the text in the first sentence of the description. Now, those videos have gone on to be some of the biggest videos on our channel, but can you imagine if we just left them? <laughs> like, eh, I guess no one wanted this stuff. No, like this is a massive opportunity that YouTube has that no other platform has. So just take the mindset of what would the viewer want? What would they search for? What would I look for? But then we can actually look at some hard numbers in their analytics and what people are actually searching for to, to, to get the best foot forward on those. Awesome. All right, this next question is gonna excite a lot of people. Um, AI tools, AI tools for editing videos because most of us are not Justin Brown who happens to have a background in professional videography. Um, what's What are the tools that you're paying attention to that we might wanna experiment with a little bit? I'm sure we could geek out on this for a long time because I know you've been playing a lot with <laughs> AI tools as well. So yeah, I, I, I want the written word side, not the video side. So I can't wait to hear yeah. what you have to say. So I, I'm pumped on this. I mean, anything that can make editing easier and faster or video creation faster and easier says this is the thing that most people hate. They're happy to get in front of the camera once they push their comfort zones, but the editing piece is where I'm really looking at the AI stuff. So there's been awesome tools like Descript that have been around for a while where it will automatically transcribe your video and you essentially edit your video from text. Um, it adds the captions and those things. And so that's still one that I use a lot. Uh, we use it for most of our video, even just do a base cut, a quick edit down, and then drop it into Adobe Premiere or Final Cut. So we've, we've been able to speed up our editing just from that alone. There's an awesome tool though that I'm playing with at the moment called Gling, G-L-I-N-G. And this takes us to the next level where it essentially does the same sort of thing as Descript, but it actually performs an edit for you. And it crosses out, uh, if you do multiple takes like I do, uh, then it'll, it'll use the last one. It, it'll look at what you've said, the context of how it's been said, and it will essentially do a paper edit for you. So it crosses everything out. From there, you can export that as a video or transfer it over to your editing program. Now that alone has saved us so much time. It means we can get from an hour's worth of content down to you know five, 10 minutes in some cases, something manageable. And even if from there, you were doing the rest of the editing yourself, you've freed yourself up creatively because you're not going through all the mind numbing stuff of cutting out all your ums and ahs and bad takes and mistakes. You're then able to, to work creatively on something much faster. So Gling is one that I'm really geeking out on. There's another one called Autopod. And this one is uh, absolutely amazing. If you're running long form videos, like a podcast, like we are here now, if you're recording separate video tracks, so a full screenshot of me, a full screenshot of you, um, you can layer those up in Adobe Premiere and you run through this Autopod software and it essentially 
does all the cuts for you. So it will switch to you when you're speaking. It'll switch to me when I'm speaking. It'll then have a, a split screen view if we want that. So, I mean, it's it's awesome to see that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And these things weren't around, you know, a few months ago, let alone years ago. So it's crazy to see where this is going. But those are, those are my biggest ones right now. Um, actually, one more honorable mention is in video. Uh, I've been geeking out on this one too, because with our videos and for anyone out there, like you need to create engaging content. And I create static videos, as in I'm not moving the camera, I'm not running around the countryside showing you all these amazing shots. It's me delivering information. So we need to make that content interesting and engaging. So to, for that, we use a lot of stock footage, a lot of B-roll, a lot of overlay footage to, to help keep the viewer engaged. So what in video has done already, and it's about to kick up a notch again, is that it will transcribe your video. It'll, um, or you can drop your transcripts in there as well. And you can actually let it go and find those B-roll clips for you. So it analyzes sentence by sentence what you're saying, and it will go to different stock footage sites, and it will drop those clips into your timeline for you, which is massive. If you've ever tried to go and find stock footage, specific clips, it takes a lot of time. So that is a massive time saver as well. And apparently with their new version of it, uh, it it's about to get a lot better. We have been experimenting with a tool called Cast Magic. I don't know if you ever heard of it or not, but um, some oh, yeah. of my fellow podcasters are raving about it. And um, it does really accurate transcription, which is really important for us because we're making articles out of our videos, right? In addition, it identifies using um, artificial intelligence the themes of the video. And it generates um, tweetable tweets and and all the all the little content that you would need to be able to promote the heck out of the video all in one swoop. I'm excited, Justin, about all this tech because like it's evolving dramatically. We're recording this in May of 2023, and my guess is even by the time this publishes, there's going to be another couple of dozen tools that are coming out. But what? I think is exciting about all these AI tools is it allows creative people to focus on the creative process yeah. and allows these tools to kind of do all the other things that have gotten in the way of it. And I feel like this is all going to unlock more creators, right? Because maybe they don't have the budget to go out and hire a video editor, or maybe they don't have the budget to go out and hire a copywriter. And these things are going to make that possible. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think for sure. And look, the other thing side of this too, is that we're hearing a lot of People that are worried about creating content now. They're worried about doing these things because we're the fear of AI. Look, I think the the human piece isn't going away. Like you might be able to get a quick answer from Chat GPT or Bard or one of the others, but it's missing the human context. It's missing the human experience. It's not it's it's facts, right? So it's good if you want to know what's the capital of this place or give me a process for doing this. But that AI has never actually gone through that process itself. It can't give you extra context or ins extra insights to it. So I don't see that the AI side of things is actually going to, uh, it's going to empower creators, as you said, it's going to make it easier, which is important. But I don't think it's going to take away our jobs or anything like that in, in this regard. Uh, maybe further in the future, which would be really scary. But uh, for, for right now, I, I don't really see that as a risk. Um, but one other really cool thing that I have been playing with in terms of AI is for topic research. We've been playing around with ChatGPT for, for quite a while. Um, but the one that I'm most pumped on right now and getting the best results with is actually Bard, uh, Google's. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. So we're using this because it's connected to the internet. I know that you can get the others to do the same, but we were updating a Canva tutorial recently and also an OBS tutorial, so two different software programs. And I was asking it, what's changed since the last video I made? Uh, and it goes through, finds, or like there was an interface change on this date. There was, um, here's, here's the newest features. So it makes my job in terms of research so much easier. I still want to go validate that this is accurate. You have to use Bing to use BART. Is that what, is that, am I, do I have that correctly or no? Bard? No, it, it's, that Google? That's Google. It's, it's Google. So I think I think you just go to bard.google.com ah. and it's, it's totally free uh, right now. And wow. uh, we've been we've been playing with this one too. And and for me, like I'm just blown away. Like this has saved me so much time to go to the website, find the change logs, and and look or to dive in and play around. We can get there so much faster. So that's another one that I've been geeking out on too. Justin, we could keep going forever, but um, we do need to 
let you get back to all the amazing things that you're doing. I do want to ask you this question. There are plenty of people listening right now that want a little bit more of Justin Brown. Um, where do you want to send them? Is there a preferred social platform if they want to interact with you? Or is there a website you want to send them to if they want to be involved in some of the things you've got going on? I think if you if you want to interact with me, I'm most active on Instagram in terms of DMs and things, but our YouTube channel would be the place to check out where we help you anything from uh, creating better videos using the gear that you already have to then getting views on them through to then the monetization and the business and the systems and stuff you can build off. So of tell that. everybody how to find you on YouTube and how to find you on Instagram. So youtube.com forward slash primal video and Instagram, it's Justin Brown PV for primal video. And then if people want to check out your Primal Video Accelerator program, where do they go for that? Is there a special website? Yeah, so the doors are closed right now, but you can find information around it um, uh, on the wait list. So primalvideo.com forward slash accelerator. And you can uh, join the wait list and we'll send out more info to you. Justin Brown, thank you so much for answering my litany of questions. We are so much better because of it. Thank you very much for having me on.